team, welcome to season two of the Leadership Experience. This season, we have a great lineup of guests prepared to talk on the podcast and share some experiences and stories with us. We'll be creating a new sub-series within the podcast this time to explore specific themes and concepts. And today will be our first interview under the new sub-series, Masters of Our Craft. Before I formally introduce our guests, you can explore more of our content there on the Leadership Experience by finding us in the Lancer Brigade on YouTube. Uh, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. So, hey, check it out. Today, we're uh, lucky to be joined by Admiral Bill McRaven. Admiral McRaven's a retired United States uh, Navy four-star admiral who previously is in charge of all special operation forces, the ninth commander of the United States Special Operations Command. During his tenure, he oversaw the raid on Osama bin Laden. He has uh, authored two best-selling books, uh, Make Your Bed and Sea Stories. And then from 2015 to 2018, you returned to your alma mater, sir, where you were the, uh, the chancellor at UT. So we're excited uh, for a great conversation with Adam McRaven, so he can part some of the stories of leadership, being in the profession of arms, resiliency, and many other the great topics that have come from him in his long career. Hey, sir, really appreciate you taking the time to join with us today. No, it's great to be with you, John, thanks. Hey, sir, so uh, I know we haven't had a chance to do some uh, catch up, but I just wanted to ask, how's, there, how's your health and the family doing? Yeah, thanks, uh, health is good. Uh, you know, I had a little, uh, a little bout with cancer a couple of years back, uh, diagnosed in 2010 when I was in Afghanistan, and uh, got, finally got some treatment in 2017. It kind of uh, got to the point where I had to get something done. Treatment went well, and, uh, and I'm back to uh, about as close as you can be to 100% when you're 64 years old, so uh, no complaints. Yeah, that's, that's great, sir. I saw that uh, you'd mentioned that in, in the most recent speech there. I think it was with MIT. And, uh, yeah. You made a little joke there about, you know, when your, when your wife came in and asked the doctor, you know, does he need to drink less or work out more? <laughs> Is his hair going to fall out? And so it's, uh, it, it's, it's great to see that everything's working out. So what is a, uh, uh, an old sailor of 37 years, sir, and then returned into his alma mater, being the chancellor of UT, what do you do these days besides just drink whiskey? <laughs> the answer is not drink as much whiskey as I probably ought to in the middle of COVID. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm involved in, uh, in a number of uh, nonprofits. Uh, I, my, my wife is on the board of the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Uh, and as you know, that takes care of the children of the fallen. Uh, I do a number of other nonprofits. Uh, I'm on the Council on Foreign Relations and the National Football Foundation, which, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and, uh, and then I do, I, I'm still teaching at the University of Texas. I teach a graduate uh, course at the LBJ School on, uh, on leadership and national security. And then doing a little writing, a little speaking, you know, what, what all retired guys do. Sir, I, I've got to ask for the, for the team that's uh, going to be listening. So what's Matthew McConaughey like as a professor? <laughs> you know, he's, Matthew's actually a very good guy. You know, he's got the, obviously, the McConaughey uh, persona that, uh, that is out there publicly. Uh, but he is, uh, he's bright, he's thoughtful, he's engaging, uh, just a good guy. And, and actually a very good family man, too. He's got a uh, you know, lovely wife and a, and, a, and a passel full of kids. And just, uh, he's, uh, he's a good representative of the University of Texas and Texas in general. I, I saw that uh, recently he had done an interview and that he was actually had mentioned that he was a professor. And yep. that he, they've got him as the, I think, like the ambassador of cool or, or something. Like that. <laughs> of culture. He's the ambassador of culture. That's right. Uh, and he does. I think he teaches a class at the, uh, the communication school in journalism, uh, you know, with, with, with respect to, uh, you know, acting and, uh, and, and public speaking and those sort of things. And, uh, and again, a very good, very good class from all I've heard. Oh, that's great. And that, and that was your major, wasn't it, sir? It was. How did that come about? Well, I couldn't do science. I couldn't do math. I couldn't do accounting. Uh, so I ended up in journalism. Uh, and, you know, it turned out to be a great, uh, a great curriculum for me because, you know, you learn how to, uh, to write coherently, concisely. Uh, you do a lot of public speaking as part of the School of Journalism, uh, School of Communications, and those traits serve me well in the military. I mean, your ability to convey your message, uh, whether you're speaking to your, you know, superiors or your subordinates, uh, I think is a critical skill set, and, uh, and UT set me up well for that. Oh, that's great to hear, sir. Yeah, no doubt, based on your experience and the time throughout your career and, you know, working through the authorities and approvals of all the things you've ever done, that, that absolutely, I know, became a, a, a critical competency that I know you got a chance to hone over the time frame. 
So, you know, I think the last time that I, I got a chance to, to see you was, was probably in, in 2011, sir. And then minus the, uh, you know, the multiple times I saw you on uh, VTC there. At, at Video J teleconference. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yes, sir. This old, like, like old times here. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. So, you know, I was, uh, for, for the team that's listening, uh, so I used to work for Admiral McRaven when I was a task force commander. And I think that back then we were standing up task force Darby. We had a little, little problem set there in the, in the Logar, uh, NERC, Sadabad district. And, you know, I learned a lot from the time from what you were there and what you were focusing in and, and prioritizing on. And then I think that, uh, you know, it was, it was actually pretty neat because that was when we were doing a lot with conventional units. And that specific right. rotation for myself we were working with 3rd Brigade, 10th Mountain, and one of the battalions that we had worked uh, pretty heavily with was 2nd Battalion of the 87th Infantry Regiment. And that's the battalion I, I went later on to command. So it was, the, you know, we had this unique history before I ended up going up to Fort, Mount, uh, uh, Fort Drum up at 10th Mountain, so it was pretty neat. And then I, uh, I think I saw you also at uh, Leroy Petrie's uh, right. Medal of Honor ceremony. And uh, if you just bear with me on a, on a quick little story that I'll share with the team. So, you know, I, I saw Admiral McRaven and I was with my wife, Jackie. And as we were walking in there, I mean, sir, the room was filled with, with all flag officers, like more stars than I've ever seen in one location. And, and, and just, to, just to share the type of guy that you are um, and leader, I saw you and you were probably about 15, 20 feet away. The room was, you know, jam packed. And I think you were talking to Admiral Olson and, you saw me from a distance and you were like, Hey, John, come on over. And then as you came, I came over and, and, uh, you know, you introduced me to Admiral Olson and, and I'll never forget. You said, you know, Hey, uh, Admiral, there's uh, I put John in a lot of tough, difficult situations, but the one thing I could make sure I can gu guarantee it every time is his hair was looking good. So, you know, my wife walked away and she was like, who, who is, uh, who are those individuals? And I shared, and actually my son was pretty excited. So, you know, the last time that I saw you, you came down to 175 and, you know, you were the key host and guest speaker for, you know, the valor ceremony that we had. And, uh, and during that rotation, Mike Foster was the battalion commander. We did the dedication. And I, rem I, I, I still remember to this day, and actually my son remembers, even though he's about five, six years old, because I, I reinforced some of the times that he's seen some of the, the videos of you. And, uh, we were doing the dedication of the combat readiness training facility for, for Dalkey and Hario. And then you saw me again from a distance and asked me what I was doing. And I told you I was getting ready to go up to JSOC and you said, Oh, that's, that sounds like Eric Carilla, you know, <laughs> all over you. And I'll never forget. You sat down and you, you got on a knee and you engaged with my son for about five, 10 minutes. And it, and, and I just share that with the team because that's the kind of personal leader. I was just, an individual and, and one of the few that just got a chance to be in the room a lot of times. And so I really appreciated that, that experience that I had. I did tell my son I was getting a chance to sit with you and, and, and discuss a bunch of things. And he says, oh, that's the Navy SEAL that makes his bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, John, th thanks for those, uh, those kind words. Uh, you know, as, as you know, from, from leading uh, the brigade, you know, there, there is no you know, greater feeling than spending time with the troops, uh, you know, and getting to know them personally. Uh, you know, if, if all you do is sit in your office and drink coffee and you don't engage uh, with the men and women that are working for you and you don't get a chance to know who they are personally, uh, then sometimes it's, it's tough to trust them on the, on the tough missions. And the fact of the matter is you and I had gotten to know each other pretty well. Uh, and I remembered your time in Afghanistan and, and, and I did uh, throw a lot of hard balls at you. And, uh, and you were, you know, you swung at every one of them and, uh, and hit a lot of home runs. And that was not easy to do back then. You know, we were, to your point, and for the broader audience here, uh, I had gotten schooled, if you will, by the U.S. ambassador when I took over uh, JSOC. And in two, late 2008, I went to see the U.S. ambassador. And, uh, and he ripped me apart uh, and said, you guys, you JSOC guys, you know, you're not communicating. You're not doing this. You're not... And I was livid. I mean, I was furious that this guy would be kind of accosting me this way. And I got back on the helo flying from Kabul back to Bagram. And I got to Bagram and I sat down with my guys and I said, is he right? Have we not been coordinating with the battle space owners well enough? Have we not been doing the things that he's, you know, accusing me of? And the answer was painful. Uh, and the answer was the ambassador was right. 
So to your point, we kind of turned the corner at that point in time and, uh, and began to work with the battle space owners, recognizing that at the end of the day, the battle space owners own the battle space. Our job as the, as the Joint Special Operations Command was to be in, in support of their efforts to get the bad guys. Uh, and we had to work together in coordination. And, and this ability to do that and your ability to work with other battalions and other brigades and, uh, and other divisions really kind of set us up for the long run at JSOC. And of course, that continues today when you see it, the remarkable uh, partnerships we have with all of the conventional forces, the interagency forces. Um, but it didn't start off well. And sometimes you have to sit there and you have to reflect on whether or not the things you've been doing for a long time are in fact the right way to do things. And you've got to be prepared to hear the criticism and not, not just because it's offensive to you. Doesn't mean sometimes you don't need to look yourself in the mirror and say, I don't know, you know, maybe I was wrong and maybe this guy's right. And uh, I've seen that ambassador a couple times since then. And I've, I've reminded him of that, <laughs> that uh, we actually got into dropping a few F-bombs. It was not a, uh, not a pleasant conversation, uh, but it was one that for me really, uh, really helped me be the right commander at the right time at JSOC. I appreciate you, sh you sharing that story, sir. You know, I, I remember during the time that I was there, just from the, you know, the 05 time frame and, and leaving JSOC, you know, about the 14 time frame, there was a lot of change in the force and, you know, led through your, your leadership and the professional maturation, just as you mentioned, you know, we were the supporting effort to the battle space owners or the battle space influencers. And it took a lot. It took a lot based on, you know, the resources we were given and the mission sets that we had and the responsibilities. But, you know, there, you also had to look at it in the same sense as based on all those things that they were providing to us as a force as well. You know, we were also not the ones necessarily that were, you know, having to work as close with the population and right. work with all these local leaders. And there was a different problem set. So I think it opened up the, uh, the force to understand. And really, there's this professional maturation, you know, that you go through. And I appreciate you sharing that story, because even at that level, sir, that's something I think that, you know, when we become leaders and, you know, we're products of things that have worked in the past and you move closer and closer to the cliffs of certainty and eventually somebody ends up sharing something with you. It takes, it takes a lot for a leader to ask those questions, you know, and, and why have we missed this? Yeah. You know, one of the things that, uh, that I always particularly pr appreciated about the Rangers uh, and you were in 275, is that right, uh, John Perwell? Yes, sir. Uh, but, but, but frankly, you know, all the battalions I saw and, and all the companies I saw that were out there, as you well know, and I think it, it's indicative of, of uh, the greater soft force and probably conventional force as well. But I particularly remember the Rangers, you know, when the Rangers would go out on a mission and they would come back, then they'd kind of get into the after action review and, you know, the collar devices came off and, you know, the privates uh, were had just as much a voice as the captains and the majors did. And as an organization, uh, again, it was a learning organization. It was a re very reflective organization you could have a, a conversation with the leadership uh, you know, throughout the course of the post-operation report because you understood that if you didn't correct the problems then, then somebody could die on the next mission. And this idea that, again, we are reflective, we are a learning organization, the only way you're gonna learn is if you're, if you're okay with, uh, with getting the slings and arrows of, of outrageous fortune being thrown at you and, and be prepared to listen uh, be prepared to accept the criticism, even if it's painful at times. And again, I always admired the Rangers uh, for their ability to do that and improve every time they went out back on the battlefield. Sir, that's a great point. You know, one of the things we, I, I uh, was working with, actually, I was afforded the opportunity. My very first brigade CSM was uh, Command Sergeant Major Chris Mullinax, and he was a platoon sergeant for me when I was in 275. And then I later went to serve 175, and he ended up becoming a brigade uh, Command Sergeant Major. Uh, for his first time here, and then it, I've been uh, transitioned out, and Command Sergeant Major Sismazic is is here with me now. But you know, one of the things that he and I would talk now, about. I, I want to hear the CSM read. You know, uh, wonky donkey again. You know, <laughs> I mean, listening to you and the CSM and Lutz and whoever else you had in there going through wonky donkey. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to kind of keep that available and share it periodically with people. Yes. Sir, I was wondering maybe at the end of this, we might get you in there for... Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm not that brave. Well, you know, sir, you, you bring that up and it's, uh, you know, one of the things I learned serving that organization was that you could disagree, but not be disagreeable. Right. And, and one of the things I actually learned from somebody you know very well, Pat Ellis, was 
you know, you should be surrounded by non-commissioned officers that want to challenge you every day because they're going to make you grow. They're going to make you better. And then, you know, the other portion about that is, is, you know, as you mentioned, being open to criticism and to the feedback. And so when we came back from the target, you know, it, it, we developed as well. It started off with, hey, we're just going to have the leadership. We're just going to talk about the target. Right. And then we realized as we're going through all this stuff, it ended up being a private in the back room during a sensitive site exploitation right. brief that was like, hey, that, that guy was in this room and this is where I found And he, he has, he's holding the one critical piece right. of information that changes your exactly right, sir, going back through the targeting cycle. And I think today, one of the things I think with all the things that are currently going on, either with COVID and the discussion for, you know, stuff that's going on in the world, it, it's important more than uh, more now than ever, I believe, that you've got to be a leader that's open and transparent. You be willing to be vulnerable to create this feedback loop. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more, John. So, you know, sir, let's, let's, uh, let's step in the time machine just a, just a little bit. And uh, I'd wonder if you'd share with the team you know, I always ask, you know, when I see new soldiers, are you a trailblazer or are you, a, you know, you, you a, uh, you're part of a legacy? And I, I know that you had a, uh, your father served in World War II, career Air Force, but what was your call or what was, and who was it or, or what was it that drove you to serve, sir? Yeah, you know, I do think it was, uh, you know, growing up in a military family. Uh, as you mentioned, my father was, he was a fighter pilot during World War II. It started off in the Army Air Corps, of course, before the Air Force. He flew Spitfires, uh, which was a British plane, but at the time, uh, the Americans didn't have anything that could take on the Messerschmitt. So the Brits loaned us Spitfires, and Dad flew Spitfires through about two years of the war, uh, cross-channel uh, support for bomber missions, and then Sicily, Salerno, North Africa. Um, and my grandfather was also in the army. He was a, a doctor in the army and served in both World War I and World War II. Oh, wow. So, so I, I kind of grew up uh, in this military tradition um, and, and really never thought about doing anything else. I, I always wanted to serve because I, we grew up on, on Air Force bases, or I did, and I just enjoyed the culture and the camaraderie. Um, but uh, of course, my dad was in the Air Force and he wanted me to, uh, to go into the Air Force, but I, I've always uh, you know, loved the idea of being a Navy frogman. Um, however, having said that, I tell folks what got me into the SEALs was actually an Army Green Beret. My, my sister uh, was dating uh, a Green Beret in probably, it would have been about 1972 maybe. Um, and of course, 72, uh, this was in San Antonio, Texas. I came to pick her up one day. And back then, you didn't, um, uh, you weren't supposed to be wearing your uniform. Vietnam was kind of still going on, and, and uh, they didn't encourage uh, the uh, soldiers to wear their uniform out in public. But he shows up at, uh, to pick up my sister. She is, uh, you know, notably late. And so I get talking to him, and he says, you know, you're thinking about going to college? And I said, yeah, I am. And, uh, you know, what do you think about doing? Well, I think I, I may go into the Navy. And he says, well, then you ought to be a Navy SEAL. And this was coming from an, an Army Green Beret. And of course, I'd seen the movie with John Wayne and I was enamored with the Green Beret. And so to have a, a, a Green Beret tell me to go be a Navy SEAL really kind of got me motivated and inspired and kind of pushed me in that direction. Um, but I, I would offer that uh, it was just this culture of the military. Uh, you know, my father had it, his father had it, this, this sense of service to the nation. You know, we talk about that in kind of glowing terms. But it was also the excitement. It was the adventure. It was, uh, it was being around you know, like-minded people in terms of their willingness to serve. And all of that kind of set me up for my career in the Navy. I appreciate you sharing that, sir. You know, one of the things I offer with the team, I said, you know, a lot of times, if, if you as a parent are doing something, a profession that is honorable, there's a good chance that your children are going to want to do the same thing. And, and, and you just highlight something just like that. You know, the experiences you have, you know, and, and it's funny because a lot of times when I, when I talk a lot about my son and, you know, he'll, he'll come with me to sit down with a group where we're talking to a bunch of company commanders. And I ask him, I said, you know, what, what is this, that this fascination of listening to podcasts and all of, and he says, dad, it reminds me of the time when, when I was younger and you'd bring me around and I would just get to listen to stories, you know, of guys serving together, the hard work, the missions, you know. And then just like anything else, you know, sir, guys that you've served with together, they come back 
and they'll tell the story like it's the first time they've ever heard it. <laughs> and everybody will be listening like it's the first time they've ever heard it as well. Oh, I've never done that. <laughs> So one of the things I, I appreciated you sharing with in your in the book Sea Stories is you talk about the volcano story with your dad and the values. And I was wondering if you yeah. could share that because I I think that that's a that's a key turning point at least that I saw um, that that points you toward the direction of of choosing to serve. Yeah. So this is uh, I guess the year would have been about 1966 or 67. I'm 11 years old. Uh, and this was the 60s. So this was the age of James Bond movies, The Man from Uncle, I Spy. And while I was raised in Texas, and uh, we did a lot of cowboys and Indians, I kind of wanted to be a spy. And my, my buddies, we all wanted to be spies because James Bond was kind of the current rage. But we lived on uh, what was called Medina Air Base. Uh, so it was an annex to Lackland Air Force Base down in San Antonio. And about a, a mile from the base housing, was this massive uh, ammunition sport storage depot. Hundreds and hundreds of these things called gravel girdies, uh, which were the ASPs. And, and the gravel girdies looked like volcanoes. They kind of came to a point up at the top. So one day, you know, my buddies and I decide that, you know, we're going to run Operation Volcano uh, <laughs> because we were cool. And, and what we'd do is we would break into the ammunition storage depot. And, uh, and if we could just touch the volcano and come back, that would be the mission. Well, it had these three fences. Uh, three eight foot with barbed wire on the top fences. And we had devised this plan on how we were gonna get over the fences with planks and things like that. And so we kind of get to the, uh, to the point, and we had all come in our appropriate uh, you know, spy gear. Uh, a friend of mine had his uh, Red Rider BB gun. Another guy had this old Fess Parker from the movie. Uh, it was called Old Betsy. And then I had a Roy Rogers uh, cap pistol that I carried with me. And um, so, I get uh, kind of going over the, the wall or the, the first fence and I make it over the first fence and I get to the second fence and I make it over the second fence and then all hell breaks loose. Uh, you know, the, the air police are coming. I can hear dogs in the distance. There's sirens going off. So I kind of go back over the second fence. I get to the first fence to make to the tree line. And as I'm climbing up over the first fence, my Roy Rogers pistol falls out, but it falls into the deep grass. I keep going into the wood line. Me and my two buddies, we escape and evade through the woods. Um, and we finally kind of get back to the base housing and everything's kind of calm. That was a Saturday afternoon. And so we, you know, we figured that we, you know, we've kind of beaten this whole thing and uh, no, no cops are coming. Well, Saturday goes by, Sunday goes by. Well, Monday afternoon, my father comes home from work. And Monday evening, he calls me into the, uh, to the living room and he says, uh, and he was the head of base operations. So he was the number three guy at Lackland Air Force Base at the time, Air Force Colonel. And he calls me into the room and he says, um, says Bill, I was told some uh, kids tried to break into the ammunition storage depot. And of course I'm starting to sweat a little bit. And, uh, and he looks me in the eye and he says, do you know anything about this? And as I said in the book, it's the first and last time I ever lied to my father. And I looked at him and I said, uh, no sir. He said, okay, okay. So it was about, about time to go to bed. So I, I head off, I take my shower, I get in my bed and there on my nightstand is my Roy Rogers pearl handle pistol. <laughs> um, so my dad had known all along and I tell, I tell the fact that over the course of the next 50 some odd years that he was alive, he never once mentioned this. And of course I had to bear the burden of that, uh, <laughs> that mischievous deed with me until the day he died. Uh, but it was, it was a great uh, parenting tool, if you will. Uh, and I, I think I feared for my life most of those 50 years, worried that dad would someday bring up the fact that he had my, my pistol brought back from the high grass. Uh, oh, that's, a, that's a great story, sir. But, uh, you know, it's, it's humorous now. And, and I know that, uh, as you mentioned there in, in the book, but just an incredible, you know, lesson in terms of choosing the harder right you know over the easier wrong yeah. and uh and it's it's pretty amazing the lesson that your dad left with you of not even having to say anything yeah. you know and and it's pretty neat but but you know again i was blessed to have two great parents and my mother was an east texas school teacher uh and as i said my father you know grew up in the air force and they had the kind of values that stick with you growing up i mean it was about hard work it was about honesty uh and you know, when you did something dishonest uh, you know, you felt terrible because you had 
you'd let yourself down, you'd let your parents down, you'd probably let other people down. And, yes. and so this idea of hard work and honesty and integrity, respect for other people, uh, you know, my, my father always made it, you know, crystal clear to me that I was to respect everybody, uh, irrespective of their rank. And, and back in the days, you know, back in the 60s, the rank differential between the officers and the NCOs, I mean, they, they just didn't, you know, they, they didn't kind of gather like we do today. I don't recall whether or not the general at the base had a, you know, Air Force chief that was, uh, as we think of the CSMs today, that just didn't kind of exist back then. But my dad always made sure that I understood that, you know, from the, from the airmen to the generals to everybody in between, you respected them. And, and, uh, and, and that, again, I hopefully stuck with me throughout the course of my career. That's, you know, so we're, we're talking about, you know, a key lesson your dad taught you. But, you know, we can't forget moms either, sir. <laughs> you know, so I, I think it was in a uh, – it was either your retirement speech or speech later on you gave – Sir, you got it. You got to share the story. You know what I'm getting at. And I know what you're getting at. It, it, <laughs> and it's and I mean, I even brought this up when I was talking to to General Brunson when we were talking about the Last Dance and Michael Jordan and his mom, right, bringing oh, him yeah. Nike and all that. So, sir, share this story about about moms and, and when you were in uh, uh, Naval ROTC. Yeah, well, I, I'll give you two, kind of two quick stories on my mom, but uh, because I think it, it it might be of some amusement to the group. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so my mother, again, wonderful mother, uh, she wasn't, I, she wasn't a doting mother. I mean, she was a, a, a kind of a quintessential Southern lady. Uh, she made sure I worked hard during the summer, uh, said, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, did all the sorts of things that uh, I think she would want her son to be raised in that fashion. Um, but you know, like all mothers at times she got concerned. So the story, uh, you're referring to when I was a senior, uh, at the University of Texas. So I'm 21 years old. And I happened to be dating two women at once, which is never a good thing to do. Um, but it was one of those awkward situations. I had met one gal on, the, on a midshipman cruise the summer before. And then I had met uh, the other woman uh, at, the, at the University of Texas. So this was kind of late in the school year. And my mother makes a phone call to the executive officer in Navy parlance, the number two guy, the executive officer of the ROTC unit. And he calls me in to the office and I'm the senior ranking midshipman. And he calls me in and he says, uh, Bill, he says, uh, I got a call from your mother. And of course I was just, what? He says, I got a call from your mother. I said, oh my goodness. He says, she tells me you're dating two women at once. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Why in the heck would my mother call, you know? And, uh, and he said, neither one of us think that's a very good idea. <laughs> but also in, in the book, I tell the story. I said, you know, I was 21 years old. And one of the women was, you know, everything a man of 21 could want. The other woman was everything a man could want for the rest of his life. Uh, I married the second woman and we remained married at, after 42 years. So I think it was a pretty good decision. But one other quick thing about my mom, and, and some of y'all will appreciate this. When I'm, I'm heading off to Navy SEAL training, so this was only uh, probably uh, three or four months after this event, and, uh, and my mother says, uh, you know, I, I'm going to drive you to San Diego. I said, oh, there is no way my mother is driving me to SEAL training. <laughs> so I drop her off at, in Phoenix uh, where my aunt was, and I continue on. Well, unbeknownst to me, she wrote me this letter. Uh, and, and mailed it to me, but I, I never opened the letter, never saw the letter. Fast forward 40 years, 40 years. My mother died in 1986. So, uh, but 40 years later, which just a couple of years ago, I'm leaving the chancellor's residence and my wife finds this letter, an unopened letter from my mother who had died 30 years earlier. And, you know, I'm pretty emotional. I see my mom's letters, my mom's handwriting. And, uh, and so I'm thinking, wow. So I open this letter and it's dated um, June or maybe July something, 1977. So I'm going off to SEAL training. And she says, you know, you're getting ready to go off to SEAL training. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm kind of full of myself. And she goes on, she says, well, you know, you've had this life. She goes, but I have to tell you, you're spoiled. And I'm reading this and she underlines spoiled. She goes, I don't think you're cut out for this kind of training. And, and I, I think the military is going to be too hard on you. And, and this sudden realization that somehow my mother as mothers tend to do, 
see their sons as the little boy that grew up. Uh, and I'm thinking, of course, to me, in my mind, I'm the coolest guy around, you know, and I'm going to make it through SEAL training and I'm tough, but not to your mothers. Um, and so she, she kind of lambasts me in this, in this letter and, uh, and says, but, you know, kind of good luck at the end. And I thought, well, there you have it. <laughs> oh, that's but she, she was fabulous. That's a great story, sir. So, you know, really, I think, you, and you also highlight, you know, what your mom did for you really is the best decision in your life was, was marrying your wife. Absolutely. So, you know, as much as we don't want, and I, I cannot wait to show this segment to my son, you know, to let him know that a lot of times that when I tell him to do something or provide him some guys, it's not necessarily the love that you want. It's the love. That's you right. <laughs> so, sir, let's, let's talk a little bit. I know. So, you get a, a, a long career, but you start, you know, within the SEALs and, and you, you laid out publicly a lot of great lessons. But I was wondering, you know, as we talk through when we kind of continue on this theme of vulnerability, I was wondering if you'd be willing to share maybe some failures or a, cru a key crucible moment that kind of changed your approach in leadership or how you looked at certain things. Yeah, well, you, you know, in the course of any career, uh, you're going to have moments where you, you falter, you fail, things don't go well. Uh, you know, for me, it was kind of early on in my career. Uh, I was assigned to an elite East Coast SEAL team uh, as a young Navy lieutenant, and, uh, and it didn't go well. And about a year into it, I was fired. Now, you know, it's never good to get fired. It's really bad to get fired in the Navy, and it's particularly bad to get fired in the SEAL teams because it's such a small organization. And I remember the day the commander relieved me. You know, I'm walking around. Of course, guys are patting you on the back, and they're saying, it'll be okay, Bill. Don't worry about it. But you knew what they were thinking. They were thinking, are you good enough to be one of my officers? Uh, you know, are you good enough to lead me in combat? So I went home that, uh, that afternoon, that evening, and, uh, you know, I talked to my wife, and I thought, I'm not sure I have a career left. Uh, you know, I've just been fired. Uh, that will go on my fitness report. Um, and I'm just not sure where to go from here. And she said to me, she said, you know, you've never quit at anything in your life. Don't start now. And there were a couple times in my career when she had to tell me that. And, uh, but it's always, you know, a good reminder. We're all going to have tough times, whether it's in our career, whether, whether it's in life. And sometimes you just have to work through it. You have to double down on your effort. And I did. I went on. Fortunately, uh, you know, I was given an opportunity to go to another SEAL team. I did well at that SEAL team and did well at the next SEAL team. And then my career continued on uh, in pretty good fashion. But it continued on a good fashion because I, I buckled down. I mean, I worked twice or three times as hard as, uh, as I could. Uh, I tried to outwork everybody. I, I took all the tough jobs to show that I could do the tough jobs. Um, and to me, that was a, a good lesson in perseverance, maybe not necessarily in leadership per se, but certainly in perseverance. And I would offer perseverance as a great trait in leadership. I just got through watching the, uh, I think it's the History Channel special on Grant. And if you haven't watched it, I encourage uh, all your soldiers to, to watch this. It's a three-part series on Ulysses S. Grant. And, you know, you take a look at Grant's life. He comes from this kind of hard scrabble life. Uh, he fails at, at a lot of things. Of course, he goes off to West Point, doesn't do particularly well at West Point, uh, struggles as an officer. He's got a drinking problem. And then all of a sudden, you know, fate kind of shines on him and he gets an opportunity to be a general in the beginning of the Union War. But what Grant is known for is this sense of persistence and perseverance. And, and he, he does not always, you know, doesn't always, isn't always successful, but he's always pushing. Uh, he's never, ever, ever, ever giving up on what he's trying to do. And, uh, and, and he just pushes through some of the most challenging and difficult times in the Civil War. And that perseverance, I think, is really what sets him apart, aside from the fact that, and I think an important point, is he was also a man of great character. He understood hard work. He had great respect for the people around him. Uh, you know, he, he had slaves, yes, but if you go back and look at the record, he treated his slaves well. He released, he freed his slaves uh, when he was down, you know, to, uh, to no, uh, I mean, he had no resource whatsoever, but he understood. He worked with his slaves in the field. I mean, there was this sense of, of uh, not, not ownership, but a, a sense of uh, kind of uh, companionship and, and uh, camaraderie that he had with the slaves that worked for him. But everywhere he went, he had love of his soldiers, uh, and all of that kind of played into the man that he ended up becoming, and frankly, you know, the man that probably saved the Union. 
so this, this situation or this uh, quality of perseverance, I think is important for any leader. It may not be the single most important quality, but as you well know, you get into combat and, and it's, a, it's a long, hard slog. And some days you don't want to roll out of your rack. Some days you don't want to work 24 hours a day, but you have to. Uh, and you just put your head down and keep working. Yeah, yes, sir. So, you know, we, we talked, you, you mentioned there this thing about values, which, which ties into the character aspect of it. Now you're talking perseverance or what a lot of people now are reading about when we try to figure out what is this thing called grit or resiliency? Yeah. You know, that you can, you know, you, you have a failure, but you're continuing to get after it. You know, where do you think this comes from, sir? Yeah, again, I'll go back to kind of growing up. Uh, and, and growing up, as I mentioned, my mother was a, a wonderful uh, Southern lady, but she expected me to work. Uh, and I mean, there wasn't, if there was a, you know, a, a summer break, I mean, I was working all summer. I worked on the holidays. I worked when I was going to school. And, and there was this sense that hard work is good for you. It's not going to hurt you. Learn to work hard. And when you learn to work hard, you know that, again, work comes with challenges at times. And you just can't throw up your hands and go, this is too tough. You just got to kind of buckle down and, and press through it. So I think it started when I was young. Um, you also, when you're going through SEAL training or, or Ranger training or, or you know, the Q course or anything, you, know, you realize that there are always people out there that are probably more talented than you are. They're smarter, they're faster, they're stronger, they're braver, they're more courageous, they're they're just people that are better than you are. And sometimes the only uh, advantage you might have is hard work. Uh, you, 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 you persevere through the tough times. When I've seen folks that are brilliant, who ought to be you know, leading the nation in certain areas, hard times come and they don't perform well. Because for whatever reason, they may have been brilliant, uh, they may have been the fastest guy in the class, they may have had talents that you don't have, um, but at the end of the day, I think hard work, perseverance, grit will get you through a lot of tough times. Yeah, yes, sir. So, you know, I think you, you mentioned two key things that I think the team can pull from that. So one, you talk about hard work, grit, just continuing to really live the grind. You know, you'll, you'll be able to get after this portion of it. And don't let something in. And, you know, I message to the team all the time, you know, strive to be better than you were the day before. Yep. Don't be comfortable. And actually, you know, you, you mentioned the experience with combat. You know, I tell my son there's only two reasons that you fall short or you fail in something. Specifically right now for him at school, we didn't study the right, you know, material. Or two, you didn't study under conditions that were going to be harder than you were going to be tested. Yeah. You know, that goes back to the training. And I know you give a lot of uh, examples and experience with that. And, and I think that the second portion, which, you know, you've highlighted, and I, I would go back to um, when you mentioned about your wife, saying, hey, you can do this. You've never quit before. So if you have this ability to do hard work and to get after something and know that you will experience some type of shortcoming or failure at some point, and then at the same time, you're surrounded by those that are not going to coddle you. They're going to make you continue to challenge over comfort. Maybe that's the key thing that's going to help you continue to push through these, these tough challenges. And I know that you've seen that personally you know, during the times of war, specifically in the special operations community. Yeah, let me offer two things, because uh, you make a great point there, John. There's a great book uh, by a guy named John Baines, B-A-Y-N-E-S, hard to find. It was written uh, probably 40 years ago, called Morale. Uh, and he talks about the fifth Scottish Rifles. But to make a long story short, uh, he talks about the great units. Uh, and, and the reason people are attracted to great units is because there are high standards. Uh, and and in, this, in the course of the book, he's, the, the fifth Scottish Rifles are a horrible unit before the beginning of World War I. Uh, a new commanding officer comes in, says, hey, boys, here's how it's going to be. These are the standards. If you don't meet the standards, you're going to go somewhere else. I'm going to give you the tools, but I want you to meet the standards. And we're going to have high standards. And they're not going to be low standards. They're going to be high standards. And the 5th Scottish Rifles go on to be one of the most decorated units uh, in World War I. And his point is most people go to a unit because they say, I want to be part of a great unit. Nobody looks around and says, where's that mediocre unit? That's what I want to be part of. Find me that mediocre unit. No, particularly not soldiers, you know, soldiers want to come, they want to be part of the best unit they can be part of. Well, you're only going to have a great unit if the commander and the command structure says, hey, boys and girls, you've showed up here and guess what? Uh, we have high standards here. And my expectation is you're going to bust your hump to achieve those standards. And we're going to hold you accountable when you fail to meet those standards. 
That doesn't mean we have to rot wire brush you every time, but it does mean we need to hold you accountable. That's kind of point one. Point two, and you mentioned it a little earlier, um, when I was uh, a, a Navy captain, uh, a colonel equivalent, I'd had a parachute accident uh, when I was a, a senior captain. Uh, it tore me apart pretty good, and I was kind of rehabbing. 9-11 uh, happens. I go off to the White House. I'm at the White House for a couple of years, but I never really get a chance to rehab. Well, about a year and a half into my time at the White House, the SEALs on the East Coast invite all the senior officers down for a, you know, a, a commander's conference. And, of course, as SEALs do, every morning we get up, and there's a PT. And of course, it's always a competition because no two SEALs can get together without competing with each other. <laughs> so we get up there and, and I, I, had, I had a badly broken pelvis and ripped out a bunch of muscles, fractured back, that sort of thing. And, and, but now I'm kind of on the mend. So I'm, I'm kind of doing the push-ups. I'm, I'm kind of making my way through some of the push-ups. But then we decide we're gonna go on a 10 mile run. Well, they start off and everybody starts off at a pretty quick pace. I last a, a couple hundred yards and then I start to fall back pretty quickly. Well, it was a two mile loop. And I remember, you know, before long, they're lapping me. And I remember one young seal as he passes by me, lapping me, he sees me kind of struggling to complete the run. And I'm only into, you know, the beginning of the first lap. And he says, Captain, what are you doing? And I looked at him kind of, funny. he goes, hey, sir, he says, you don't have anything else to prove. You know, you don't need to be out here. You've got nothing else to prove. And, and then he bolted away. And I kind of wanted to stop the kid and, said, and say, oh, you're absolutely wrong. You don't understand the way this works. You got to wake up every single day and realize you have something to prove. And, and for a Navy SEAL, you know, it is about, are you good enough to be wearing the Trident? And the day you wake up and think you have nothing left to prove, I don't care whether you're you know, a colonel or a four-star admiral. Every day you've got something to prove. Every day you've got something to prove to yourself. You've got something to prove to the men and women that work for you. You've got something to prove to the nation. Uh, and, and that proof is about being the very best you can. Uh, and, and again, the day that you think you have no longer have anything to prove, that's probably the day to move on. That's, that's great advice sir, for the team. And I'm actually, I, I really wish I could have FaceTimed this so my son could hear this. He said I had to pull them out of this COVID depression where he's no longer <laughs> seeing any, you know, social, you know, butterflies and all those things. But it's the exact same thing. You see it as a parent when you're raising kids, especially when, you know, the climate has changed a little bit for him as he's going through. But it, it's, it's the same messaging that I get for him, you know. And so it was funny because, you know, he's a pretty athletic guy. And, and I, I've told this story to, to some of the team before. You know, he comes out and I said, hey, you're going to start working out with me. And every day, you know, it's going to be something different. You're not going to know what the challenge is because if you don't know what it is, then you're not going to grow. So he comes out and he wants to test the old man. And he's wearing an altitude mask. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you want to wear an altitude mask? Okay. So I throw my altitude mask on and I could see, sir, you should have seen it in his eyes. He was like, uh, you're, you're not going to stretch out? I said, hey, there's like 4,000 versions of you that are want to test the old man every day. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm ready to go. And so for the next two weeks, he quickly realized, and now, you know, I'm, I've created this monster as he's going back on the, on the program. That's good. Good and, on you. So, and good sir, parenting. I, I will now, I, you know, he's, he's got this David Goggins thing in his mind. Oh, and he's talking about <laughs> being a Navy SEAL. So uh, we're going to have to work on that portion a little bit later on though. So, <laughs> so the, uh, you know, I appreciate you sharing the, the piece there about going through the, uh, the rehab. And I know you mentioned and you, you credit your wife as well for helping. Again, you. Yeah. So, you know, it goes back to that same thing. We're talking values, the great stuff that your parents have taught you. We talk about character. We talk about this hard work that builds this grit, resiliency, perseverance inside. And then it's now we're talking really opportunity. And so when you go to this and I and, and we're kind of I'm almost I don't want to say it's parsing stuff out about key leadership aspects of it. But I think the, the next thing that I think a lot of leaders would absolutely be drawn to you is about your decision making and your judgment. Yeah. And so, you know, a guy, uh, you know, Mike Foster used to, to, to raise us by saying, you know, uh, everything that you do, right, is about sound judgment. Go for it, yeah. do good, avoid evil. Here's my non-negotiables, kind of lay out and then go. And then, then from there, I'm empowering you to, to make good decisions. And when we look to develop leaders, it's about developing leaders to make better decisions yeah. in combat at the highest level, under duress, time constraints. So, 
you know, one of the things I appreciated is you were telling some of those stories and I was, I was wondering if you had a couple of them you could share and then maybe we talk about just, you know, I, I kind of read it as a little bit, now you get to the, the, the most visible mission, which is going to be the raid on Osama bin Laden. As you walk through the priests of going through judgment, making decisions to develop in this thing of tacit knowledge and mitigating risk, I was wondering okay. if you could share some advice for the team. Yeah, let me talk about it in a couple of different uh, kind of frameworks. First, you know, when you're making decisions, uh, you know, your day to day decisions that may not have anything to do with, you know, re leading the big raid or something. I always tell folks, look, there, there's kind of three litmus tests. Are, is, is the decision you're making and are the actions you're taking moral, legal and ethical? That's it. Moral, legal and ethical. Ethical, are you following the rules? Legal, are you following the law? And moral, are you following what you know to be right? And I would offer that 99% of the time, you know exactly what that decision needs to be. It's just not always easy to make it, which is why leadership isn't always all that easy. But, but now, as you get into kind of tactical uh, kind of decision making, um, I mean, the, the one thing that I always found important was find uh, the men and women who have the experience in a particular situation, draw on that experience. Uh, when I first got to Iraq, so I had just become a one-star admiral. I get to JSOC. Uh, I'm in JSOC a couple of months. The next thing I know, I get sent out to Iraq. I relieve. Uh, I do a turnover with the Air Force general that's there. And now I am in combat for the first time, really, in my life, Desert Shield and Desert Storm aside. And the day I get into Baghdad, that night, uh, the guys are getting ready to go out on a mission. And so they come to brief me. It's like you know, it's, it's midnight local time. They come to brief me and they said, hey, sir, we got this target. Uh, it's out in Al-Ramadi. Uh, looks like it's going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to take, you know, two helicopters, got some Delta Force guys, surround the compound. We think the guy will probably come out. We'll get him. We'll come back. And I'm thinking, okay, this is kind of my first mission. I got it. I understand all that. Well, 30 minutes before they launched, they come back in to see me. And they said, hey, sir, everything's changed. Uh, looks like there's a lot more bad guys on the target. we got some overhead pictures. Uh, we're going to go now with five helicopters. Two of them are going to have to land in the compound. Going to have to bring the Rangers with us. I mean, the level of complication went up, you know, tenfold. And so I, I kind of cleared everybody out, took the two guys into my office, and I said, okay, look me in the eye and tell me you can do this mission. Look me in the eye and explain to me what the risks are and tell me you can do this mission. Because if you can't convince me right here, right now, we're not doing this. And they talked me through it, and I said, okay, I got it. I understand the risks. And they went and did the mission. The mission turned out fine. That was mission number one. 10,000 missions later, and I kind of figured it out at one point in time, that in the course of my almost six years in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan, somewhere I touched 10,000 missions. Either I was in command of them, uh, you know, I reviewed them, because as you know, most of the missions had to go up to a general officer. Certainly in the early days, you'd re review the CONOP, or I went out on the missions. With, I went out with the Rangers and the SEALs and the, and the Green guys uh, routinely. So somewhere in there are 10,000 missions. By the time the bin Laden raid came along, um, the experience that I had, the operators that I brought in, the, the 160th guys that were flying the helos, I mean, it was a fairly straightforward mission. The issue for me was, you know, we're going to go through the planning process because this is, is important. And back to, I think, as you know, John, I wrote this uh, thesis when I was in postgraduate school. And the idea behind the thesis was for a special operation. It had to be a simple plan, yes, carefully concealed, repeatedly rehearsed, and executed with surprise, speed, and purpose. And that framework uh, that I kind of uh, worked through in my head at postgraduate school, I used that for, frankly, I used that for almost all the missions that I had a chance to, to look at. So when we did the bin Laden raid, there were a lot of folks that were saying, hey, why don't we do an offset parachute drop? Uh, why don't we, uh, you know, take a vehicle from here to here and then we'll patrol in? And of course, that complicated matters. The, the, the issue for me was, hey, let's keep it simple. We're going to fly from point A to point B. We're going to fly right to the X. We're going to get the bad guy. We're going to get back on a helo and come straight back out. So there was this concept of, look, if, if I do an offshoot parachute drop, somebody gets hurt on the drop zone, uh, we get compromised on the drop. I mean, there's a thousand things that could go wrong. So you got to keep the mission simple. But what I'd offer is it really kind of went back to uh, relying on experience. Early on in the war, uh, 
I found it interesting, uh, certainly as a Navy guy in an Army world, and as you know, and probably for, the, for your audience, uh, you know, the Navy SEALs are, are kind of a small portion of the special operations community. Uh, so very quickly, uh, very early on, I realized I needed to understand everything there was about the Army. I needed to essentially become an Army officer if I was going to function in, in this, uh, this Army world. And I had the greatest respect and admiration for the, the generals and the soldiers I worked with. Um, but I also found that those generals or admirals that hadn't been in the war, that were back in you know, Stuttgart or back in the States, and when the war was unfolding and you had people that were actually in the fight, um, they saw things completely different than the generals who had been to command a staff college or the generals who had even commanded a, you know, a division, but a division that wasn't in combat. It's not that they weren't great guys, and eventually they got the experience, but the difference between somebody that had been on the ground, fighting the bad guys, understanding the complications of, yeah, you say you want to call in artillery, but we're right in the middle of a village. You can't really call in artillery. Uh, you say you want to do this, but you don't know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. I mean, the complicated nature of the war, uh, if you hadn't been there, your decision process was probably going to be flawed. So whenever I came up against a situation that I hadn't had the chance to be part of before, I would call in people that had been there and done that and, and ask them their best uh, guess if, to some degree. And then you just you know, do the best you can to make the right decision. I think, I think that uh, when you laid out sort of your, your little paradigm, right, essentially keeping it very simple, rehearse, rehearse. So when you do have a contingency, yep relying on those that have experience. So they're the ones on the ground that have probably rehearsed it just as much or had the experience of doing this and then going through. And, you know, we, we talk a lot in the profession of arms, which, which I would offer is, you know, we have this awesome responsibility of making decisions. And it's really this professional, repetitive professional judgment to manage two things, violence and risk. And, and one of those things, I think that as you tell, and I'm listening to your, your you've laid out this paradigm, and you shared with us is it also comes down to this thing called tacit knowledge. So, you know, you've gotten to the point where you've done 10,000 raids. And so I, I always, you know, share, and it, it doesn't matter whether I was a task force commander, or a ground force commander, or now a battalion or a brigade commander, I always have to remind the leaders or commanders that says, if it doesn't feel, it kind of goes back to that, you know, you know, ethical, moral, legal, if it doesn't feel right, I said, that's that experience that you have. That's that tacit knowledge. And so, I, I, you know, based on, on, on what I've heard and, and you've laid this out, which I, I appreciate it, I was wondering if you had any other, any other thoughts in that you could lay with the team for those when they, they gain this experience over time and they get to their 10,000, whatever rep it is, that feel as they go through this portion, they shouldn't second guess because that's part of that professional development that ends up. It's almost like, when a surgeon is going through a procedure and the algorithm or all the literature tells them to do one thing. And, and, and it, I, I, when I heard your story about, uh, uh, about cancer, you know, I went through the war college and as I was going through this, I, I was, I went to the, the GI doc because just like all, all the special operators do, you know, we're chewing on Motrin. You know, I was like, I think I gave myself an ulcer. You know, I told my wife, I told Jackie, I think I gave myself an ulcer. And so I went to the doctor and I went to the GI and as they were giving me this, you know, this, uh, this treatment, they said, we're going to do an endoscopy. We've got to do a colonoscopy. We'll check. Well, as we went through this, the, uh, the doctor, you know, came up and said, Hey, you know, you got some gastritis, which is essentially ulcers. He goes, but we also found this thing called malt lymphoma. And so I was like, I don't know what that is, you know, and say, no, no, no. And then he was very calm, but he's like, here's the protocol that we need to go through. And so next thing you know, is I'm sitting in all these different, you know, things I'm going to see an oncologist and it, and it never really dawned on me until I, you know, the, the guy that I had to go drink the fluid that, you know, glows my insides to see if anything else was going on, had the bedside manner of a ranger squalor. He's like, all right, I found cancer in your body. You're going to drink this thing in 30 minutes. We'll be able to find what we need to do so we can come up with a plan of attack. And I, I came back and I was like, wow. And so I, I tell you this because then I went to an oncologist and I got to the point, sir, where a radiologist, uh, oncologist was really ready to kind of give me the treatment. And, you know, the, the oncologist I was seeing stopped and goes, listen, before we start this, he goes, let me send you to this, you know, uh, malt lymphoma specialist out at Hershey Park. 
sir, this guy came in, he read through my files. I had never seen him. Kind of like your, you know, as I'm hearing this, like your first mission. He goes through this stuff and he goes, okay, hang on a second. So you're telling me they found this, then we did the ultrasound, nothing, everything else was clean. This is the case. He goes, here's what we're going to do. This specific type of malt lymphoma was, was uh, a lot of times is uh, produced by this virus called H. pylori. He says, uh, so, I, am going to, I am going to treat you like you have H. pylori. He goes, because I don't want to serve this radiation because you're going to come back to me in 20 years and tell me that I gave you cancer. Yeah. He goes, and then I want to give the same GI. He's going to do the same scope. And by him making that call, sir, and then them turn around and telling me that I was clean, that right there gave me the example of this is an, an example where he had known all the literature was telling him this is the next step, but the feel was different. Yeah, and of course, as you probably know, John, I mean, I had the same experience when, when I was first diagnosed with my chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, the doctor uh, did not have a great bedside manner. Uh, again, I was in Afghanistan at the time. I got a video teleconference call from Fort Bragg, uh, and she said, hey, um, you know, this is bad. Uh, it's in your spleen. You're going to have to come back, get your spleen taken out, start chemotherapy. And oh, by the way, your career is probably over. And this was 2010. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's a bit of a kick in the gut when you go, whoa, you know. Um, but uh, well, I went back and, you know, I, I tend to raise my wife a lot in these issues because uh, you know, one thing I would offer is, you know, as you go through life, you better have a battle buddy. Uh, you know, in combat, it's always the CSM or the Master Chief. Uh, but, but back home, I've been fortunate uh, to have a strong woman by my side. And, uh, and she kind of took on the ranger mentality and said, nope, uh, we're going to do some, uh, some more hard work. We're going to find the, the world's expert on this. We did. When I went to see him, he was like, eh, you'll be all right. Uh, you know, go back to Afghanistan. Just don't get shot. And uh, again, uh, eventually it, it caught up with me, but we, but we took care of that. To your point, it, it is about finding, you know, the experts uh, that, uh, that, one, understand the totality of the problem. Now, I will offer one caveat on that. So I, I'm kind of the guy that goes by my experience and kind of leads with my gut. But you have to be careful about that. Uh, I would say that, you know, 95% of the time, my gut was right. My experience, when I'd say my gut, it was based on my experience. But it wasn't always right. And, uh, and there are times you can get a little too cocky. Uh, and I would offer that uh, either I got cocky or the, the folks that worked for me got cocky and we didn't go through all the procedures we needed to go through. And because we, we thought we understood what we were looking at and it didn't turn out well. And, uh, and when it doesn't turn out well, when you do, again, back to this idea that, hey, you're going to be reflective on this. Um, boy, I had to sit down and say, you know, where did I go wrong? Where did I fail to make the right decision at the right time? And I think a lot of it, as I look back on it, was, I assumed some things because I didn't go through, you know, from kind of A to Z and, and looking at it. So what I'd offer is your gut instinct is always important. Your experience is important, but don't forget the process. You know, what your experience allows you to do is to decide, you know, where you can truncate the process, where you can speed the process up, but you kind of need to go through the process, uh, the risk matrix, if you will, every time, the decision matrix every time in order to complement your experience and get to the right answer. Yeah, that's, that's great advice, sir. That's, that's really going back to that last piece that you talked about. You know, you could go through this solely rely on your gut. Don't forget the process because that helps you clearly identify the risk and what you need to mitigate and kind of take the emotion of, and, and a little bit of, of, of the hubris out based yeah. on, you know, that you, as you've gone through this. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, if we transitioned, you know, all this great experience that you had, you've gone through this, now you've, you've finished up your time, you end 37 years, incredible career, and then you end up becoming the, uh, the chancellor of your alma mater. What skill sets or competencies that you, that you learned over that time frame you felt really helped in this transition of this job? And, you know, as I listened, you know, to a lot of the things that you were doing, I really got to say that, that he's demonstrating, you know, a lot of the things that he did really well here and almost this building this unity of effort to change a lot of things and implement a lot of things there at University of Texas. So I was wondering if you could highlight some of that stuff, sir. Yeah, you know, what I'd offer to you is, you know, whether you spend four years or, or 40 years uh, in the Army, uh, you are gonna have, you're gonna come away with these remarkable leadership skills. A lot of them you won't even realize you have because they just kind of become part of your DNA. But when you transition to the civilian world, whether it's the corporate world, or in my case, the academic world, and the University of Texas system was, 
14 institutions, uh, 230,000 students, 100,000 employees, large. But all of the skills that I had as a senior leader in, uh, in the military, they transitioned seamlessly to running uh, a large university system. Now, uh, the, 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 you know, when I made the transition, I remember early on, you know, I hadn't met anybody. I mean, I, I'm kind of, it's just me. I show up and, uh, and I remember the woman that was essentially my XO. Uh, I didn't know who she was at the time, but I'm meeting her. And, uh, and I said, uh, Jana, I said, Is, are, there, are the people kind of concerned about, uh, about me, you know, coming in? And she said, uh, well, uh, yes, sir, they are a little bit. And I said, well, what are they concerned about? And she said, uh, well, sir, you know, every new chancellor that comes in brings their people with them. Uh, so, I mean, we know you're going to bring your people with you. And I said, uh, uh, Jen, I, I don't have any people. You know, you are my people. Um, she goes, but, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're bringing. I said, no, 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 I, I, I retired. There are no people coming with me. And then, of course, their other fear was that, you know, somehow we were all going to be marching around and saluting and ringing bells on a quarter deck or something. I said, stop. I said, it's not going to be that. And I told her the story about, again, once again, being a Navy, a Naval officer in the Army. I said, one of the advice, pieces of advice I used to give to all the SEAL officers and senior enlisted was, learn everything you can about the Army. Understand, you know, how from the lowest level it works. Understand what a first sergeant does. Understand what a sergeant major does. Understand how our artillery works. Understand everything about, you know, you, everything you need to know about the Army. And, and then you can use what the Navy has taught you. But learn to be a good Army officer or a good Army NCO. So when I took over the job as the chancellor, I said, look, I have to learn everything there is about academia and healthcare, because the large healthcare part of this. So tell me what a, a chair of a department does. Tell me what a dean does. Tell me what a provost does. What does formula funding look like? How do students get in here? So you have to learn the environment you're stepping into. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you learn the environment well enough, then the leadership skills that, that, that you have always had in you, you'll be able to leverage those much better. You know, when I first went to my very first SEAL team, uh, I got there and, a, and this uh, crusty old Navy lieutenant who had been a Vietnam vet said, he said, Ensign, he said, the first person you need to see is the Command Master Chief. Go sit down with the Command Master Chief. He will tell you what's really going on in the team. And so I made a point every time I went to a new team, and of course we moved about every two years, you'd get to a new command. My first stop was always with whoever the senior enlisted person was. Find out what's going on. Find out what the expectations are of you as a leader, whether you're a platoon leader, whether you're a task unit commander, you know, whether you're the number two guy or the number one guy. Find out what the troops are thinking uh, and, and, again, how you can best serve the troops. Because at the end of the day, leadership is about getting the job done yes, with the people you have. And you can't do that if you don't understand what issues the troops are dealing with. I think that's sound advice, sir, and that's the same thing that we echo here going to see the first sergeant if you're a lieutenant, going to see as a company commander, command sergeant major or battalion commander coming in to see the command sergeant major, they will provide you, you know, some key insights based on their experience as well as a different feel for a lot of things that'll right. point you in the right direction as you're moving out. You know, as, as, as you've gone through, and I appreciate you sharing when you walk in, getting a good uh, feel for your environment and understanding that, and then letting those traits kind of come through, you'll start to see those things and how to apply them. You know, I'd wonder if, as we kind of move toward the end of this, being, being a leader that has, has served for 37 years and then now working in academia, um, and then what you're doing now, sir, how do you stay relevant as a leader? And then, you know, you, you see specifically, at least in the, in the profession of arms, one of the beauty about of this institution is it spans several generations, three, maybe even four at times. How do you make those connections? How do you stay relevant? Um, and, and specifically, how do you foster this creativity and innovation? They see things a little bit different. You know, they approach things a little bit different. How do you stay relevant as a leader to stay making an impact and connection with them, sir? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that question, John, and then I want to go back and touch on two more things. Uh, you know, first, I think every, you know, any leader has to recognize uh, the fact that you have to be in a, a continual mode to be educated, to learn. You have to come into work every day. I, I talked about, you know, every day you have to prove yourself. Well, proving yourself means making sure you understand the business of being a soldier. Uh, so if there's a new weapon system, you better go down as a leader and understand what that weapon system does. If there's a new, you know, piece of technology, you better make sure you understand what that technology does because frankly, that will be part of your decision process 
and how you're going to kind of manage the force and use the assets of the force to accomplish the mission. So you know, if you ever get to the point where you're not learning something new every day, uh, then you're probably moving backwards. The best way to learn things, of course, is to talk to the young soldiers. Uh, and of course, you learn a whole lot of things talking to the young soldiers. <laughs> Sometimes it's not just about uh, the new iWatch that they're wearing, it's about all sorts of things that's going on in the command. So, uh, yeah, I made a point always of kind of, you know, trooping the line, uh, you know, walking the line at night, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning when I was in Bagram, I'd go out and, and go into the watchtowers and sit there and talk to some young infantry kid who, uh, you know, was from the middle of, uh, of Iowa and the first time to Afghanistan. And, and you know, you, you get these great life stories, but you also find out things that, that I think are important to you. So uh, the other thing I'd offer is, I think it surprises people, but I'm the biggest fan of the millennials uh, you'll ever meet. And, uh, and that surprises folks because there is this narrative that the millennials are these, you know, soft little snowflakes. Uh, and I'm quick to point out, well, then you've never seen them in a firefight in Afghanistan, or you've never seen them coming to, you know, some school at the University of Texas to, to make a better life for their country uh, and for their family. The fact of the matter is they're different than my generation. They're different than your generation to some degree. But, but there are some great things they bring. I mean, they, they, they will question, they will push you. Uh, and that's good. I mean, that's good for an organization up to a point and, until the decision is made. And then they've got to learn to kind of move out together and, and get the, the task assigned. Uh, but you, you have to be able to leverage. They've got these great personal relationships. Uh, they, they take good care of their friends. They ask the hard questions. They mobilize when they see something they don't like. Um, so I think as a leader, You've got to spend time with the young men and women in your organization, uh, really get a sense of, of the change in culture. Now, at the end of the day, they also have to adjust to the environment. And this is what has to be taught to them. So you got to take the good with the bad. The good is uh, they're going to come with new ideas, with new ways of doing business. That's good. But they also have to be taught that, hey, we are a uniform service and there is some uniformity and uniformity and good order and discipline are what allow a unit, a military unit, to be effective. Uh, so figure out how you're gonna, how you're gonna meld those. Let me uh, go back to kind of two other points I wanted to talk about. When I made the transition to the University of Texas, my staff, I brought my staff in, and again, it's like any sort of four-star staff, if you will. I had very senior folks, I had about 15 members of my senior staff, and they were you know, PhDs, MDs, lawyers, uh, brilliant people, great folks. Uh, frankly, probably one of the best staffs I've ever had. But on day one, and I generally made this a routine when I got the new commands, on day one, I said, folks, here's the deal. Your responsibility is to let me know when I'm walking into a minefield. If you see me doing something wrong, I not only expect you to tell me, if you don't tell me, I'm going to hold you accountable for walking me into that minefield, not telling me. So you know, tell me when the emperor doesn't have any clothes. Tell me when I'm making a bad decision. Now, I may decide to make the decision anyway, but I don't want to walk into any situation without being fully aware of the risks, the political risks, the, the tactical risks, the strategic risks, the personnel risks. Don't hesitate to talk to me. And, and I want to encourage you to do that. So you always lay the groundwork kind of on day one, but then you've got to be receptive. So the first time somebody steps up and goes, Hey, Chancellor, that's, that's really a crummy idea. And you wire brush them, that's the last time anybody will come to you. So I actually would seed an issue. I went in on like day two and I had some wild ass idea uh, that I knew was bad. And I wanted to see if anybody would say time out. Fortunately, they did. So you have to build a culture of your senior leaders feeling comfortable coming to talk to you. Because as a leader, if if you don't know what's going on, you are gonna put your brigade, your battalion, your company into a bad situation because people were afraid to come talk to you. Uh, you know, we had, uh, had an incident uh, a couple of years ago, two Navy ships, the, the McCain and the Fitzgerald had collisions at sea. And as a Naval officer, having spent a lot of time on ships, I could not imagine how that was possible because there are so many checks and balances. But in both cases, the commanding officer was in his stateroom. And the young officer on the bridge never came to wake up the commanding officer. And the civilians, you know, when they saw this, they, of course, the Navy immediately relieved the commanding officer, along with the next guy in the chain of command, the next guy in the chain of command, and the three-star admiral in the chain of command. The Navy relieved all of them. Uh, 
and civilians would, would write in and they'd say, I don't understand. That commanding officer was asleep in his stateroom. How can you hold him responsible? And of course, those of us that were naval officers said, you obviously don't understand how this works. Mm -hmm. Because the question is, why didn't the young officer on the bridge wake up the commanding officer at two o'clock in the morning? Did he not wake up the commanding officer because he was afraid, because the commanding officer had created a culture or an environment where that young officer was afraid to roust him out? Did he not follow the night orders or the log book? Mm -hmm. So did he not establish enough good order and discipline so that the officer on the bridge understood exactly what to do? Did they not, as it turned out, there were some mechanical problems with the helm? Did they not train them well enough on that? So at the end of the day, it was all about the commanding officer. At the end of the day, the responsibility for the brigade rests with you. Uh, and if you create the right environment, then the people will come to you when there are problems and you will be much better equipped to, to deal with those. Sir, I appreciate that. It's, it's uh, absolutely true. You see that, and we talked about, you know, you get some informal feedback, you get, you know, feedback that you get through some surveys, but really at the end of the day, it's, it's how many of those individuals are willing to come to you, you know, right. face to face and provide some of that fee feedback and, and, and direct level, you know, and it's the challenge. It's the same mention I, 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 I highlighted before. It's okay to disagree, but not be disagreeable. And that goes right. back to your point and saying, hey, open up with the ideas, challenge, make it better. But at the same time, once the decision's made, then it's, we're all moving. And we're about together. That's exactly right, sir. Right. So the, uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time with us today, sir. You know, you've laid out some, some key insights, you know, and, and I would recommend those that have not uh, checked out either one of your two books. You, you, you really continued to be a steward of the profession and shared a lot of great lessons. And if we went back and just started from the talking about, you know, values and character and work ethic and grit, decision making, uh, you know, just for the team that's listening to this, this is an in, in, incredible insight, you know, and it's well over 37 years and the stuff that you're still doing today is, is incredibly impressive. Before I, you know, I, I end and, and then leave the final word with you, sir, I did tell my son, that I was going to offer two things because he told me, uh, uh, I, I want you to ask Adam McRaven uh, two things. So the first one is, is that before Adam McRaven signs off, you has to answer, why did God create army Rangers? And then, the, and then, the, cause he remembers that response sir. Oh, yes, I do. That response. And then the second thing is he, he said, I want you to tell Adam McRaven that I cannot wait until he makes his presidential run. So, <laughs> Hold on one second. <laughs> I know what you're grabbing, sir. So why God made Army Rangers? So that Navy SEALs could have heroes too. <laughs> <laughs> Courtesy of uh, General Carrilla. <laughs> <laughs> sir, thanks again for all the time that you spent today. We always leave the team and, and let them know, hey, what are your questions? And I'll leave the final word with you, sir. Hey, thanks very much, John. First, uh, you know, to, to all your great Lancers, uh, I tell you, you know, as an old retired guy, uh, I, I am always so inspired and, uh, and motivated to, to be around the great soldiers uh, that are serving this country today. And, uh, and these are challenging times. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it is tough with COVID. It is tough with the social unrest. It is tough, uh, you know, with what's happening in the world. Um, but every time I have a chance to talk publicly, uh, you know, and, and you kind of go through this litany of all the challenges in the world. At the end of all of my public discussions, I'm quick to point out that I am incredibly optimistic. I'm incredibly hopeful because I have spent time with the young men and women in the service. And frankly, in, in the broader uh, community here, uh, doing great things, the first responders and the cops. And, the, and uh, if you can't be hopeful spending time with soldiers, uh, <laughs> then you can't be hopeful about anything. But uh, but thanks for what you're doing. Uh, thanks for what you and your great soldiers are doing. And, uh, and John, anytime I can be of help, please don't hesitate to call me. Sir, thank you. I really appreciate it. You bet. Take care. All right, sir. Take care of yourself. You bet.